Well, welcome everybody. Greg Peterson coming to you from the Urban Farm in the heart of Phoenix, Arizona. And tonight I have Kari Spencer. We're here for composting made easy. Yes, we're gonna we're gonna learn all about composting and we're gonna make it real simple. And cool. we're gonna make some gardener's gold. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. It's, it's, it is uh, the amendment for soil for yes. gardeners. Yeah. And and it um has a lot of other benefits too. All right, we're going to talk about that, but before you advance that, I want you to tell everybody who you are and where you're from, and I think you're finishing a book here in the next 30 days or so, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I'm, yeah, I've spent more time in my office lately than than seeing the sun, uh, I know. trying That's to get it bites. done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's a whole lot of fun. My name is Kari Spencer, and I'm with uh, the Micro Farm Project, and we grow a lot of food on our property, and we just really love the lifestyle of, of growing our own food, and I'm writing a book about urban farming for a company out of the UK, and the deadline is approaching, so I'm working <laughs> fast and furious, but I'm real excited about it. It's, nice. Yeah, it's, nice. A, it's city farming, and it's all about uh, how to grow food in the city and techniques that people are using and just the basics also of growing nice. food. Nice. Nice. And composting is one of those basics that you need to know if you're going to be a stellar gardener. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even for people who aren't gardeners, composting has a lot of benefits. So. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Perfect. Well, here we well, go. Well, welcome to class this evening. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to you and let you get going. All right. So the compost cycle, it mimics what nature does to decompose organic material and put the nutrients back into the system. So decomposition, you know, it's kind of gross, like CSI kind of stuff, you know, things that something that we often don't want to be around. You know, you, right. you stumble upon something that has died in the forest and you walk way far around <laughs> it. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. But it's nature doing its job to, to break down um, plants and animals that that die and return all of the good stuff that made up the the plant or the animal and put it right back into the system and uh, and it becomes nutrients for the living creatures and the living plants within that system. Now composting does the same kind of job, but it speeds it up makes it a lot quicker, and also reduces some of the unpleasant aspects of decomposition. So when you're composting, as things are breaking down, it shouldn't smell bad. It shouldn't be attracting, um, it shouldn't be attracting bugs and animals, and it should happen very, very quickly. Of course, you can compost slowly, too if you are a lazy composter like I am. So we'll talk all about that tonight, what the difference is between fast composting and slow composting. Um, but composting is just basically nature's way of recycling. Now composting has many, many benefits. When you make compost and you put it on your garden, it helps your plants to have more uh, resistance to disease and environmental stresses because of the nutrients and the um, fungus, the bacteria, and all of the really good stuff that is in the compost that feeds the soil, it makes the whole system stronger. It also boosts nutrient levels in the soil and helps to improve the structure of the soil. So if you have really compact soil that's hard to work, Putting some compost in there over time will help to loosen up the soil. On the other side, if you have real sandy, loose soil that doesn't hold water very well, adding some compost will help it to have better structure and hold water better and hold together better. So it improves the soil no matter really what kind of soil you have. If you have acidic soil or if you have alkaline soil, Compost can also help to buffer for pH issues as well. 
Um, having a lot of organic material in the soil helps to prevent erosion. So if you live on a slope or if you live in an area where there's a lot of runoff and your soil gets washed away, well, putting some organic materials in the form of compost into that soil will help to keep it from eroding as badly. It also helps to improve water infiltration. So it helps water to soak into the soil faster and better. And it helps with retention of that water so that the soil holds the water longer. Um, so many other benefits of composting. Uh, it also you know, reduces your yard waste disposal costs. So if you have to pay to have yard waste removed, um, then you don't have as much to, to remove. Um, it keeps that waste out of the landfill too. So yard waste and kitchen waste keeps it out of the landfill and actually uses it as a resource rather than um, mummifying in the landfill. It will help you to save money on watering your garden because your garden will be improved as far as the water resource is concerned. And it reduces your soil amendment costs. You won't need to uh, use as much fertilizer and your plants will be healthier, so you won't need to use other, um, you know, other measures to take care of your plants because it will make the whole system stronger and better. And all of this occurs without cost, using waste, without additives or chemicals. So that is a really awesome thing. I love it that I can take things that um, would be just waste and turn them into something really valuable for my yard. That is really great. So when you're getting ready to make compost, we just need to understand that it is alive. Now, the organic materials that we put into the compost pile, they're not alive, but the bacteria and the fungus and the um, decomposing insects and worms and all the things that will enter your compost pile to break it down, they are alive. And so when we mix them all together, the organic material and the decomposers, it's like one big mass of living stuff that's active. And we've got to feed it. We've got to water it and keep it, uh, keep it healthy, keep it alive. So we, we want to feed it a diet of carbon and nitrogen from organic sources. So we will, uh, we'll talk about carbon and nitrogen and the ratios that, that you need for composting. And when I say organic, I don't mean organic in terms of the USDA organic label. I just mean things that were once alive and have now died. Okay, so plant materials primarily. Okay, and then you will want to ventilate it. It needs air. So you're going to need to provide good aeration so we'll talk about how to aerate your compost and what kinds of bins are appropriate to provide enough aeration for your compost pile to essentially breathe. You also need to water it. It needs adequate moisture. Okay, so starting with the first one, we said feed it, aerate it, and water it. So when we're feeding our compost pile, we wanna maintain a healthy diet. Um, for the pile by adding both browns and greens. And if you've been around gardening or composting circles for very long, you've heard these terms, browns and greens. Browns are materials that are very dry and stable. They've probably been dead for a while, um, as in the case of dry brown leaves. Um, they do not break down very quickly. Um, things that have been processed also, like paper, those are considered browns. Uh, sticks and sawdust, these are browns. And you know they're browns because they do not break down very quickly at all. So fall leaves, hay, straw, and corn stalks, even shredded cardboard and newspaper. Um, so if you get the newspaper, you can shred that up and put it in your compost pile rather than throwing it in the trash. And newspaper inks are, are usually okay. The colored inks, 
Um, some people say you should avoid those, especially, I know for sure, you need to avoid the shiny inks. So if you get some flyers, and some of it has a matte finish that's not shiny, that's okay for the compost pile. But if you if tucked in there are some shiny flyers, just throw those away because um, those are probably laser printed and there's some chemicals in there that you uh, may not want to add to your compost pile. But any, you know, junk mail um, printed in matte inks, those are okay to shred up and put in the pile as well. Uh, paper plates, paper bags, paper towels, as long as you haven't used any any harsh chemicals um, with the paper towels, then you know if you just wipe up a water spill or something, go ahead, put that paper towel in your compost pile. It's okay. Chipped brush, anything that is uh, made out of wood <laughs> is fine for the compost pile. Sawdust. You just want to make sure it's real wood, though. You don't want any particle board things with glues or or you know any any fake wood because those might have formaldehyde and some other chemicals in them. But anything that is real wood is fine to put in your pile. And pine needles are also great source of browns for the compost pile. However, if you live in an area where your soil is acidic already, I wouldn't put any more than 10%. Um, I wouldn't 10% of the pile made up of pine needles. So if you rake up a whole bunch, you might want to put them in a few at a time rather than putting a whole bunch in your pile all at once because it can help to make your soil a little bit more acidic. And if you already have acid soil, then you don't want to make it more acidic by putting a whole bunch of pine needles in your compost. If, however, you live in an area where the soil is very, very alkaline, the pH is high, then pine needles, you can just put as many as you want in the pile. Keep in mind that when they're fresh, Pine is antimicrobial. We use it for cleaners like pine salt. So it can kind of uh, slow down your compost pile for a little bit. But once those oils and the moisture in those pine needles are dried up, once those needles are brown, that's no longer an issue. Um, so you can use as many as you want in the pile if you live in an area with alkaline soil. So those are browns, these dry, stable, organic materials. If you set them out on your kitchen counter, they wouldn't break down noticeably for a very, very long time. And they're very stable. They do not attract pests. So we want a lot of them in our pile. They also contain a lot of carbon. And carbon is, uh, is a necessary uh, nutrient for plants in order to build their their uh, tissues, right? So we need to get the carbon into the soil for the plants. And also, the more we're putting into the soil, the less we're having in the atmosphere. And so all the better if you're concerned about uh, the amount of, of carbon that's in the atmosphere. We can sequester it in the soil where it's really useful to us. So we want to try to get a ratio of three parts brown to one part green, and we'll talk about greens here in a minute. Now, this ratio does not have to be exact. You do not need to measure your uh, compost materials. Just try to get a lot more browns to greens. If you live where there are lots of fall leaves, collect them up, save them. You can use those. Those are really, really great. Here, where I live in Phoenix, it can be a little bit challenging to get a lot of browns. So I probably use more paper in my compost pile than I would if I live somewhere that had fall leaves and lots of foliage. Um, but uh, just try to collect up some of those browns and make sure you have plenty of them on hand for your composting. Okay, then you want to add some greens. Greens are nitrogen rich, and nitrogen is the nutrient that helps plants grow their green and leafy parts. And so nitrogen is an extremely important nutrient for plant growth. And it, it is, uh, the nitrogen levels are high in organic materials that we call greens. These are materials that have a lot of moisture, high moisture content. And 
many of them were recently alive. And if you set them out on your kitchen counter, they would attract flies, probably, maybe other pests, ants, and they would break down quickly. So as an example, if you leave a salad sitting on your counter, it doesn't last very long. You know it's a green because it has a high moisture content and it breaks down quickly. So vegetable and fruit waste, these are green. Eggshells, they don't break down as quickly, but they are a source of nitrogen and they are considered a green. Coffee grounds, even though they're brown in color, are a green. And they are wonderful for the garden. And you can even throw your filters and tea bags in there as well, as long as they're made out of um, natural material. Uh, now the filters and tea bags are, are technically a brown, but I'm, I don't separate mine. I just throw it all in together. So I'll call it all green. Um, manures from, from uh, animals is also a green. And the manures that we use in composting are primarily from animals that don't eat meat. They're uh, vegetarian, vegan, or vegan animals, with the exception of chickens. Chickens can eat meat, uh, but we still use chicken waste in our compost piles. Um, but you can use rabbit manure if you've got Guinea pigs, you could use the guinea pig waste. And if you use a natural bedding for your guinea pigs, you could throw the whole, um, you could throw the whole thing in all at once, the bedding and the waste all at the same time. Uh, urine from animals is also fine. So if your bedding has urine in it, that's okay for your compost pile. But don't use any waste from humans or from animals that eat meat, such as dogs or cats, because the, uh, the first of all, the bacteria needed to break it down will kind of compete with the bacteria that is needed to break down the uh, other types of waste. But also, it can attract pests really badly and contain E. coli, salmonella, and other nasty germs that we really don't want to be putting in our garden. Uh, most of those are going to be taken care of by the composting process, but just to be sure that we're not putting any uh, harmful bacteria in the garden, we just avoid using any waste from carnivorous animals. You can also put weeds from your yard into your compost pile. Uh, if, it, if the weeds are really, really seedy, you might not want to include them because then you might just be spreading weed seeds in your garden down the road. Now, most seeds are killed by the hot composting process, but you run the risk of seeding your, your uh, garden with weeds if, you don't, um, if you're not really, really attentive and careful with that compost. So because I don't, I'm not particularly careful with my compost, I like it to be easy, I just don't put seeds weed seeds in my compost pile. You can also put grass clippings. Dry grass clippings are considered a brown, but fresh grass clippings are a green. Okay, so we don't need as many greens as browns in the pile, but we do need some. You can also put a lot of other things into the compost pile that I didn't mention, and you might wanna Google this and just look, look up all the different things that you can put in your compost pile. There are many, many things. You know, anytime something goes bad in my fridge, I put it in the compost pile. And, uh, you know, anytime we have, um, you know, trimmings from the kitchen or if we have uh, even things like nutshells or if I have spices that I want to throw out because they've gotten bugs in them or they've gotten old, if we have... Um, you know, leftover pasta or rice that's not enough really to save, I'll throw it out into the compost pile. And even pasta water from cooking pasta, I don't put salt in it, uh, but the pasta water is great for keeping your, your uh, compost pile moist, right? So there are a lot of things that we can put in the compost pile. And the great thing is that when we put them in the compost pile, we don't send them to the landfill and they can do some really good work for us in our garden. Some things that we avoid putting in the compost pile are meat, chicken, fish, and bones. 
And the reason for that is because the bacteria needed to break them down can compete with the bacteria needed to break down vegetable material. And also, meat and chicken and fish will attract pests like crazy, like cats and raccoons and <laughs> other pests that we really don't want. Mice, yeah, mice also. We don't want those in our pile. Fatty foods will also attract mice. Grease, oil, peanut butter, that kind of stuff. Mice just love that. So if you want to keep mice out of your pile, don't put greasy stuff in there. Uh, anything that doesn't break down, this might seem obvious, but you don't want to put styrofoam or glass in the, in the pile and other things that are real stable and won't break down. Uh, dairy products, you can put some. Like if you, uh, if you have something that goes bad in the fridge and it has just a little bit of cheese on it, throw it in the pile. But if you have a whole block of cheese that turned moldy, I wouldn't throw that in the pile because that will attract pests. Um, and we already mentioned dog, cat, and human waste, so I won't go over that again. Plants with diseases or pests, you might not want to put into the pile because if the disease or the pest is not completely eradicated by the composting process, then you will be infecting your garden. Uh, so just avoid that. You can, uh, you know, get rid of those and, and feel just fine about throwing that kind of stuff away. Um, also, if you have very alkaline soil, I would avoid putting any kind of ash in the compost pile uh, because ash will make your pile more alkaline. Um, on, additionally, if you live in an area that has very acid soil, then ash is a really, really great thing to put in your compost pile as long as it comes from wood not charcoal. Charcoal contains chemicals that you do not want in your garden, but wood, uh, when it burns, that is just fine as long as you haven't, you know, doused it with a lot of chemicals. Um, also, antimicrobial things, you want to put them in the pile in moderation, pine, citrus, eucalyptus. These items, I would let them dry pretty well before I put them in the compost pile because they are antimicrobial. We use them for cleaners and they will kill germs and we need germs in the form of bacteria in uh, thriving in the compost pile. So we don't want to knock them back by putting antimicrobials in the pile. A little bit at a time is fine. If you have a lot to put in, I would ration it out and put it in a little bit at a time. And if you have pine or eucalyptus, let it just let it dry out significantly before you throw it in your compost pile. All right, if you have some weeds that are seedy or diseased and you really want to use them for your compost pile and not throw them away, then put them in a plastic bag, tie it up and set it in the sun and let it just cook. For a couple of weeks. It will get really gross inside that bag, but that will act like an oven and it will kill any pests, any diseases, and any seeds that are in those weeds. So then you could use it on your compost pile more confidently. Okay, now that was feeding the compost pile. Now we need to make sure that it's um, that it stays wet enough. Okay. A compost pile that dries out completely will cease to break down. Well, not completely. It'll still be breaking down, but it will slow down the decomposition process very significantly. So we want to keep the pile a little bit moist. Okay, with that in mind, when you're siting your compost pile, figuring out where to put it, I recommend putting it near a water source so that it's easy to get it wet. If you live in a really wet area, just leaving it open when it rains might be enough. But in an area that's dry or has dry seasons, you will want to make sure that it's near a water source so that it's easy to get the pile wet when you need to. Make sure that it's close enough to you to make it convenient but don't put it directly against your home's foundation because it's going to need to stay moist. We don't want it right on the foundation. And we also don't want to attract pests right up to our house. So if something 
goes a little haywire or it attracts a pest, then we don't want that right next to the house. But if you put it at the back 40 of your property, then it's going to be a pain to deliver your materials to it and you might forget about it. So, you know, there's a balance here. Just make it convenient for you um, and so that you will visit it and actually tend it. Um, put it near some growing plants so that when you trim those plants, you can throw it right in the compost pile. And conversely, when the compost is finished, you can put it in the soil where those plants are growing and just make it real simple. Also, if you live in a really hot, dry area, I would give it some shade. Okay? That way it won't need as much water. If you live in a really cold area or a really wet area, then you might want to put it in full sun where it can uh, dry out a little bit between, um, between the times that it gets soaked. And also so that it can heat up faster uh, as uh, when the pile is working. Here are some examples of bins. You want to choose a container that is at least seven cubic feet. That is roughly the size of two full large wheelbarrows. Okay, it should hold two full large wheelbarrows full of material. Um, or you could say two by two by two feet, 55 gallons. These are some rules of thumb because you want the pile to be large enough to hold moisture, but not so big that it becomes difficult to manage. Okay, you've got to be able to use a pitchfork and stir the pile. And if it just gets too big, then that can become very difficult. So just keep it a manageable size, um, but big enough to hold water. Also, your bin should be easy to open easy to turn the materials and have holes for aeration. It says have hold on the screen, but it's holes for aeration. If you live in a dry climate, then you don't want very many holes, just a few. If you live in a very wet climate, then you might want to have a lot of holes. If you live in a wet climate, like these pallets or the wire compost pile on the upper right might be best because then it can dry out a little bit um, after it gets soaked. If, however, you live in a very dry climate, then perhaps the, up, the composter on the upper left or the bottom center or bottom right would be better options for you because they will hold more moisture, have less evaporation. Now, if you live in Phoenix, uh, we can get converted garbage bins for $5. And I'm going to go back a slide just for a second. So they look like the bin on the bottom right here. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, you know, so you can Google this if you live in Phoenix, and you can find out where, uh, when they're open. And you just need to bring some cash, and then you go pay for it, and they let you select your bin. Now, if you don't live in the Phoenix area, you might want to check with your city and find out if your city does this, because many, many cities do. And many cities have programs that will provide you with a free or a low-cost compost pile if you want it. Also, I know that many cities are starting to collect um, organic waste for city composting operations. So if you have more waste than you want or can compost on your own property, you might check to see if your city has a program like that. Okay. So you want to keep your pile as moist as a wrung out sponge, and we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. But let's just jump ahead to how do you even do this? How do you get started? We know we've got to feed it. We know we've got to water, aerate it and water it. But what is the actual process that we go through? Well, it's as simple as starting to collect your household scraps. So just place a covered bin, bin outside the door in a convenient location, like right outside your kitchen door. Or you could collect scraps in a bin on your counter or under your counter. 
And uh, they do make these special compost bins that have a charcoal lid that helps to absorb any odors and uh, keeps the fruit flies away. But you don't have to do it that way. I just would use an ice cream bucket. And I would use that ice cream bucket until it fell apart. And then I'd get another. We'd just have to eat another bucket of ice cream. And uh, so I'd have another bucket. But you don't have to use a special fancy one. You can just uh, reuse any kind of small bin. Just make sure it has a lid uh, that you can seal to keep pests and fruit flies out of it. Okay, so your five basic ingredients for good compost. You need organic materials, the browns and the greens that we discussed. You need microorganisms and animals. Animals such as, um, when I say animals, I actually just mean like bugs, ants, earthworms, things of that nature, these are already in the environment, okay? So you don't have to add them. If you have a compost pile that has contact with the environment, with the soil, then the microorganisms and the decomposing creatures will find you. They will come to you. Uh, you need water. And the goal is to try to achieve about 50% moisture content uh, so that the microorganisms have enough water to, to live and to perform the activities that break down the materials. 50% uh, moisture content feels about as moist as a wrung out sponge. So that's a rule of thumb there. Uh, you need to give it air. So good, good circulation is the basic requirement. And you will need to turn the pile. This process will help to make sure that oxygen penetrates the pile to keep it aerobic. Okay, so aerobic meaning that it's decomposing and the microorganisms are doing their life um, activities in the presence of air, of oxygen. Okay, if the oxygen does not penetrate, it might go anaerobic in which case the pile will begin to um, be more putrid. It might smell like ammonia um, and just not break down as well. So we, we've got to turn the pile to keep it oxygenated. Okay, now you've been collecting materials. You've collected browns, lots of browns, and you've collected some greens. Your first layer in your compost pile should be composed of something really absorbent. Okay, so that if you get it wet, it will catch any excess liquid and the, the liquid won't just run across the ground and away from the pile. Okay, so some kind of browns is, is recommended. Then after those dry materials, you'll want to put a layer of green material. Okay, and you want them to be fairly small pieces. They don't have to be minuscule. But if you have paper, you want to shred it. If you've got grass clippings, they're probably small enough. If you've got twigs, you might want to cut them down into one or two inch pieces. Um, and just the smaller they are, the faster they will break down. Um, but you don't need to make them really, really tiny. That's just too much work. Okay. And then so you've got a layer of greens. Okay, then you'll want to put a layer of browns on top of the greens. Then a layer of greens, then a layer of browns, like a lasagna, you're building a lasagna with brown and green materials. And every time you add greens to the pile, you want to make sure that you cover it with a blanket of browns. This will help to inhibit any odors. It will help the pile to absorb moisture and it will help to deter pests. Flies don't like to land on shredded paper. They like to land on green materials, right? So if we can cover those greens with a layer of browns, that will just help to deter the unwanted pests. Okay, now, in composting, we talk about a specific kind of composting called hot composting. There's hot composting, which is real fast, and there's cold composting, which is slow. Okay, so we're going to talk about hot composting here for just a few minutes. 
Okay? Compost, organic materials, will heat up when the microbes in the um, materials are active. Okay? So if they're happy and they're active, they're eating, they're reproducing, and they're breaking down the materials, then your compost pile will feel warm to the touch. And you may even see steam rising off of it. And when you are composting hot, uh, the pile will break down very, very rapidly. And weed seeds, disease, pests, they will, um, they will either die or they will leave the pile. Okay, so there's a lot of benefits to hot composting. And in order to keep your compost hot, you need to layer those browns and greens and uh, make sure that your waste is chipped up relatively small. Then you wanna keep that pile as moist as a run, wrung out sponge. Okay, so when you add the materials, you wanna get it wet. And then you wanna come back in a day or two and see if the pile has gotten warm. If you're brave enough, just stick your hand down in there and you'll feel it. It won't get too hot to burn you, but you'll feel the, the warmth. Or you can get a thermometer to do the job for you. And it should be heating up, okay? And it'll stay hot for a while. Eventually, it's going to begin to cool down, okay? At that point, you will want to turn the materials with a pitchfork, with a rake, with a shovel, or any number of tools that are made specifically for turning compost. You can get a thing that looks like a corkscrew you can, um, that you can turn and it goes down into the pile and then you just lift that up and it turns the materials, which is pretty cool. Okay, but whatever method you use, just turn it. You want the materials that are on the outside of the pile to end up towards the middle and vice versa and then get it wet and it should heat up again. And you can go through that, uh, those, um, that system a few times, but eventually it's going to look, smell, and feel like soil. Okay? It won't look like shredded carrots and won't look like uh, shredded paper. It will look like soil. And at that point, it may not heat up for you anymore. You can turn it. You can get it wet. It still won't heat up. Okay, If it's not heating up and it looks and smells and feels like soil, then really your job of composting is, is uh, done, okay? So a well-tended pile can provide this finished compost in two weeks to a month, okay? And we say it's finished, but it really isn't completely finished. Your work is done. Now all you need to do is allow the compost to rest for a period of weeks or a period of months. The longer, the better, generally, but for most of us, we're not going to leave a pile for six months. We might leave it for a few weeks, um, which is, is fine. And this allows the compost to cure. It allows it to finish breaking down. It um, allows the um, healthy bacteria that doesn't like the hot compost to re-inhabit the pile and just uh, makes it ready to go on your garden. So make sure that when your compost is finished that you just let it sit around for a few weeks before you put it on your compost pile. Sometimes what happens when we put fresh compost in a garden is it creates an effect that we call a burn. So plants will begin to look like they've been scorched. And really all that is is that the, not, the compost wasn't completely broken down. And so uh, there's a little bit of lag time. And the microbes that are breaking down that compost are robbing nitrogen from the soil and from the plants in order to, um, to support their own life cycle and to support their own metabolism. And so then when they finish breaking down the organic materials in the compost pile, they release the nitrogen back into the garden. But uh, in the meantime, your plants can suffer some. So 
by allowing your compost just to cure for a little while, that can help to eliminate that burning effect. Okay, so troubleshooting the compost pile. Um, most compost piles do not have very many problems. If you follow the steps that we went through, uh, you shouldn't have very many problems. But occasionally a problem will arise. And the good news is that these problems are very quickly reversible. And you're not going to make a mistake that can't be undone uh, because they're, most problems are very easily re reversible. Okay, so if you notice that your pile has a rotten odor, it could be that there's too much moisture, um, in which case you're just going to want to turn the pile to aerate it and add some brown, some dry materials, and that will help to eliminate the excess moisture. Um, if it gets too compact, okay, then air cannot penetrate and you can get a rotten odor. It goes anaerobic, like we talked about earlier. Um, and to solve that, just turn the pile. Or maybe you might need to reduce the pile size. Maybe it's just too heavy, too much material. Um, so turn it, and if you need to, break it into two separate piles. If you notice an ammonia odor, that is caused either by excess moisture or too much nitrogen, which is the same as saying too many greens. And if you remember, greens are high in moisture content. So this makes sense, right? So to eliminate the excess moisture, you want to turn the pile and then add some, some browns, some high carbon material to balance out the green materials. And that will eliminate an, an ammonia odor, okay? If your pile will not heat up, Perhaps the pile is too small, so you can just make it a little bit bigger. Or um, if the pile is too open, maybe you want to make it more closed and insulated so that the heat will stay in. Uh, maybe it's not wet enough. If it's not as moist as a wrung out sponge, then maybe you need to add a little bit of water and, and turn that pile. Um, because aeration can also cause it to stagnate. Okay, so you need to have good aeration. If your bin doesn't have enough air holes, this can really uh, slow down a pile and just make it go putrid rather than composting. So if your bin doesn't have holes in it, you might want to drill some holes in the sides and get a little more air. I had a bin like that, and I don't know why they make a compost bin without air holes. I had to add them um, after it started to really get uh, stinky and it wasn't breaking down it was just turning into soup so aeration is really really important to the process um, if it's not heating up maybe you have too many browns and not enough greens so you could add a little bit of grass clippings or some manure or even some organic nitrogen fertilizer like some fish emulsion might help to get it cooking so to speak um, also cold weather of course, can just slow down a pile. And that's going to happen naturally, especially in really cold climates. And so during the winter time, your compost pile might just uh, sit dormant for a while. That's okay. You can wake it up in the spring by adding some greens and adding some moisture and turning it when the weather warms and get it cooking again. Okay, if your temperature, if the temperature gets too high, uh, that's a sign that your pile is too large. And this really only happens in places that do commercial composting, or perhaps if you have horses, you might be able to get enough materials where the compost gets too hot. Um, but that's not really a common problem for most household composters. Um, but pests might be a problem. If you've got any meat scraps or fatty food, you're going to get pests. And so just don't put them in there to begin with. And if you do notice some pests, then add some more brown materials and keep a nice thick layer of brown materials on the top of your pile. Now, once your compost is finished, okay, and it's cured, um, how do you use it? Well, you want to sift out some pieces that have not decomposed, okay? This is a picture here of my husband. Uh, he just put a 
wire mesh screen over his wheelbarrow and he would put the compost on top and use a rake to push the compost through the holes in the mesh and anything that was too big he threw back in the compost pile and that way we had nice really fine sifted compost and it was easy easy to do um, then you can let that compost sit and cure and then mix it into your native soil you can use it in your container gardens you can use it for raised beds you can use it as a soil amendment on top of the soil as a mulch um, it's just something that you can use all the time in your garden and I recommend that you save some of your finished compost used as a starter for your new pile. Okay, so you can just throw a scoop of it into the new pile to help your new pile begin to decompose. Okay, if you want to use compost as a mulch on top of the ground, uh, like a blanket, you can put several inches all around your plants. Uh, just make sure you give them, give your plants a little bit of breathing room. Don't bunch up the compost against the plant stems. Um, but two or three inches of compost on top of the soil can really help to reduce weeds, can help to regulate the temperature of the soil so that it doesn't get really hot in the summer or freeze um, as quickly in the winter time, and it can help to reduce water evaporation so that when you water, less evaporates out the top of the soil. Also, if it rains, the compost will help more moisture to actually penetrate and absorb into the soil rather than just uh, running across your property and out into the street. Okay, so um, a layer of compost as a mulch has some really great benefits. It also feeds the microbes in the soil. And those microbes, um, those microbes break down nutrients into the in the soil into forms that plants can actually use. All right. So by feeding the soil with compost, you're actually, in the long run, feeding your plants and making them stronger. Okay. You could also make a compost tea. Now, there's um, compost teas and there's compost emulsions. A compost teas, you want to Google that because that requires um, a little bit of uh, a little bit of aeration um, and a little bit more of a process than just making a compost emulsion. Okay, so what's the difference? Okay, compost emulsion, you could just put some compost in in a in a um, in a sock or in an old pair of pantyhose and stick it in a bucket and let it steep. Okay, and once it has steeped, then you can pour the liquid on your plants. You could spray it on your plant leaves um, and you could use it uh, just as, you just use it for watering your plants. And that will be a really nice amendment for your plants. Adds a lot of nutrients, adds the microbes, and uh, all the healthy stuff that is in the compost will go into that liquid. Uh, if you want to bump it up a notch, you could dissolve a half cup of organic molasses in a bucket of water, um, and you could submerge an aquarium air pump in the water for aeration, let it bubble for a few days, and really grow the microbes. So this just helps the microbes to really proliferate, and then you can use that on your garden, either as a foliar spray on the leaves or as a drench for the soil. And what's the benefit of doing that? Well, these microbes are very healthy for the soil and in, in the long run, very healthy for your plants. They help to uh, ward off diseases that might try to attack your garden. They help to break down nutrients for your plants um, and so many other things that those microbes do. So you could make a tea. Before we take questions, I just want to mention that we talked about hot composting. And we said, you know, this was going to be a class about composting made easy. And then I proceeded to give you a whole bunch of details and teach you about compost tea and all that stuff. But I will tell you that if you want it to be really, really, really easy, um, if 
you're like me, I am a little bit lazy. And my compost pile will sometimes sit for a long time before I get around to getting it wet and turning it, right? That's okay. It'll break down still. It'll just break down much more slowly. When I get around to it and I add water and I turn it, then it comes back to life and it will compost quickly for a while. And then if I forget about it or if I go on vacation and it just sits there, that's okay. Okay, Things will break down whether we're tending to them regularly or not. All right, so don't worry too much about, um, you know, measuring browns and greens or about making sure that you're always uh, checking the pile um, unless you want to. If you want to see how fast you can break it down, then that's a fun challenge to do. Um, but if you don't, if that's not your personality, then it's okay. You don't have to tend to it all the time and it'll still break down for you eventually. And I also compost with chickens. So if you have chickens, let the chickens in your compost bin. They will do some of this turning for you. And they also, when they uh, eat the materials and they deposit manure, that manure can really get your compost cooking quickly. So if you have chickens, check into different ways to compost with them because they're great helpers in the compost pile. Um, but basically, you just want to have a mixture of browns and greens. Make sure your browns are on the top of the pile. They're always added last. And then you just need to keep it as moist as a wrung out sponge and turn it when it begins to cool. Um, and you will very quickly have wonderful compost for your garden. 